Welcome to another episode of Two Dudes in a Cage, Fighter Spotlight. Today we have Roxanne Mata Ferry. Roxanne is a pioneer of women's mixed martial arts. She has been fighting since 2003 professionally and has 50 professional fights. She is a BJJ black belt, a brown belt in judo, and she has fought for organization, organizations like the Strike Force and the UFC. Uh, man, she is going to go down as a pioneer for women's MMA and MMA history. Uh, Roxanne, thank you so much for being here. Welcome. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you just want to start by telling us a little bit about yourself? Get, get yourself introduced and uh, welcome to the fans. Sure. Uh, I was, you know, I, I grew up in Pennsylvania, a happy middle class family. You know, I did sports as a kid, loved anime and wanted to learn Japanese for a career. So I studied Japanese language and literature in college and I moved to Japan and got a job in Japan after college. Wow, that's, that's amazing. So you've been all over uh, Japan. I bet that was crazy living there. Uh, really cool. I've always wanted to go to Japan. I don't know about living there. It's probably two totally different things. But, uh, it is. It was awesome, though. I first went on a student exchange program, so I was shown the ropes of society by my host mother, so to speak. And uh, then when I moved back from my job, I kind of knew my way around and I knew what to do and what to expect. Oh, yeah, that's really cool. That's awesome. So, so oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask, um, while you were in school there, were you training martial arts there as well or... Yes, I started jujitsu in a, as a freshman in college. So when I moved to Japan, I had already decided on the goal of doing MMA. And when I found a new gym, you know, I went to Japan, I found a, a gym that had jujitsu, kickboxing, uh, a famous shuto fighter was out of this specific gym. So I told the head sensei that I wanted to fight and he got me my fight, my first fight. Wow. That's really cool. So do you want to uh, just talk about what it was like living and training in Japan? Um, was a, uh, It sounds like you uh, you had a relatively easy time transitioning. So did a lot of people speak English there or was there a, a major communication barrier like in your training and then just regular like, trying to go out and get something to eat uh, or, or was it relatively easy? Oh, good question. When I first went there on exchange, my Japanese was still not great. You know, I had taken two years of intensive classes, but, you know, I half the time I didn't know what anyone was talking about, but people were very nice. You know, I was still a college kid. So the adults kind of took me under their wings and helped me out. So it was a bit more of a challenge when I first went there, of course, than when I had graduated. By that time, I had taken a full four years and then I was able to talk my way out of a paper bag, so to speak. So if I couldn't understand a word, I could like ask around the word in more simple Japanese and figure out what they were talking about. So um, I was able to understand better, although there was a language barrier. And I there was one thing, like when I first went to Japan, I ran into more of a situations where um, men didn't want to hit me or train with me because I was a woman, which, you know, at first I was really mad about it. I was like, I'm a girl. You got to fight me too, because I didn't really run into that in America. Everyone just kind of hit me normally. <laughs> um, but then I thought, okay, let's be sensitive to this. Like, of course, guys probably wouldn't want to hit a girl, especially from Japan where girls really don't train. And they're more like, you know, the early 1900s, like the housewife, like they don't do sports and stuff. So let's, let's not get too mad. But I remember like one time um, I met this one guy, I think it was Shu Inagaki. He was one of my, well, he has become a friend and I was like, hit me harder, harder, harder. And like that really stuck with him. And it was like a really big funny point for him. But anyway, now I don't, I, I didn't have any problems with that after I moved back. It's interesting that you brought up um, that you had at, it was a change for men not wanting to like strike and roll with you. Cause I literally just read an article for us. The hobby has that same, uh, his preference is he will not roll with females just because he had experience of a student. So it's interesting that you brought that up and how and I think that's reasonable too. Like, mm -hmm. you know, if a guy doesn't, I mean, a guy can't really be challenged too much by a girl anyway, unless they're the same size. So mm -hmm. And this, you know, I understand. Yeah, yeah, especially at the instructor level, like 
what is a black belt really going to get with rolling out of a lower level student or, or something along those lines? Right. I mean, they're going to help them, teach them that that's going. Cool. Yeah, yeah really. right, right. Okay, good point. Yeah. So with moving to Japan, um, wanting to like study the language, was that because of your love of anime or did the anime come after and you just like, what got you into wanting to study the Japanese language? So I always thought it was really cool to be bilingual and to have two completely different sets of lingua and be able to speak two languages. And then when I watched anime, I just loved the way Japanese sounded. I thought it sounded cool. Like I just thought it was such a cool like flow and I loved the sounds, you know, I appreciated it as like an art. So um, I chose and, and then I wanted to know what they were saying in Japanese when I watched the anime. So it was kind of like a hobby that I decided to turn into a career which was kind of naive because you kind of have to be bilingual, like raised natively in order to get like a UN job or like a super high translation, pay, high pay, level paying translation job, which is what I wanted. So I kind of got to experience Japanese as a tool to do other things rather than use it as, as a career, but it still worked out. So with that, what's your favorite anime? I have my top three, Naruto, Dragon Ball Z, and One Piece. One Piece is a newer one, right? Not really. No? <laughs> like 2003 or something. Oh, okay. I first started watching it in college, and I've been watching it for like, 50, whatever, 18 years or something ridiculous. It's still going. Well, well, Nar- it's newer than Dragon Ball Z. It's newer than okay, Z. Yeah, Naruto it. and My Hero are the to and Sailor Moon are the three big ones in my in my household. Okay. Oh Sailor Moon, I haven't heard that one for a while. Okay. <laughs> yeah, my my niece loves Sailor Moon and they're starting to get into Attack of the Titans. Ooh, that one's pretty gory. <laughs> I hope they're old enough. <laughs> they're, they're 13. So Okay, okay. The eight-year-old hasn't discovered Attack of the Titans yet. Good. <laughs> I like close my eyes. <laughs> do you like love death and robots i'm not too far into anime but i have watched that no is it good uh i like it they're they're real short stories and they're all different but the animation is really cool i i think so uh, and they're all they all have like different style of animation to them too oh, okay so, uh you know i think for like a regular person who's not really super into anime they're really cool for me so i'm gonna write that down and then watch it later it just came uh, out i with, keep forgetting someone else uh, maybe it was even you recommended that to me and I, I totally forgot robots so, i like i like it it's, it, it's cool it's cool stuff but i don't know Thanks, if it's like typical anime or not i don't think it really is though in the sense but but it's cool that the stories are really cool i like it yeah. That might be nice to watch when I'm about to fall asleep, but I need like something else. There Sometimes like perfect. my brain yep. off. Yep. So you just recently retired. Was it really hard for you to come to that decision to retire? Yes and no. So a couple years ago, I kept getting a lot of questions because I was getting older, you know, and I think I was almost, they're like, oh, if you win another fight, you'll fight for the title. And then I lost. They're like, oh, <laughs> like they meaning fans. So I kept getting questions. It's like, you know, I don't want to talk about retirement. I don't want to talk about it. Like, I'll think about it when the time comes. And then I started getting headaches in the gym after sparring practice. Oh, yeah. I was like, okay, crap like I had made myself a promise many years ago that if I ever started having like concussion symptoms I would quit and um uh it used to be like a couple people hit me too hard so I avoided them but then like people who I trusted who didn't try to hit me too hard kind of like start, I still got headaches I was like all right that means it's everybody so I decided to like do one more fight and then retire so it was pretty easy once I realized that was what was happening like my brain was just worn out you know and not as sturdy so but I I'm glad to report that I've made it out with all my brain cells you know any symptoms I had were light I did some research and it was all like super light you know I never had any light sensitivity I never lost memories or anything like that I still have my cognitive function so I made it (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah. yeah that's good that's good to hear it's good to to know when when to hang up the gloves per to say instead of 
you know, having to deal with those things later in life. So I think that's really smart. It's unfortunate, but it's really smart too. Yeah. So, and I, I think other, I'm oh, sorry to interrupt you. I think oh, yeah. uh, all fighters should be educated about it. You know, I was very close minded in the beginning. Like my dad sent me newspaper clippings in the mail. I was like, oh, I'm a letter from my father. How wonderful. I open it up. It's about a boxer who's like having trouble with CT. I'm like, dad, I'm not a boxer. And he's like, but still. So I was like, all right, my dad's an intelligent man. Let me read the article. But I think through that annoying, like parental pressure, it made me like aware. And that's why I made the promise to myself. Like, okay, I promise that, you know, that. So I think that all boxers and anyone who gets head, head trauma should be aware. At least these are the symptoms this is what you have to be careful for. Don't necessarily like, tell them to stop, but, you know, educate them so that they know what to look for. So. Sure. So and I'm glad you brought up CTE because you know, it's a very, not new, but beginning stages of knowing what it is. What do you think, for a fighter standpoint, the risk of CTE is? I haven't actually done a ton of research on it, so I don't know if I can speak intelligently on it. I just know that I wanted to stop before I got any minor symptoms, and I think those would be more major ones, so... I, I don't, I'm not sure I can speak intelligently on it. It's good that you had, you know, you made yourself a promise. If I start getting these symptoms, I'm going to stop because a lot of fighters are, you know, like Tito Ortiz still wants to fight. Mike Tyson's getting back into fighting. And I'm not saying, you know, way high level more than me, but it's good that fighters are starting to get a sense of, my brain is important. I need it the rest of my life. Yeah, I think Felicia, Felicia Spencer retired due to that, due to like being aware of that and worried about that. And mm -hmm. then another girl, Brianna, somebody who fought my best friend a while ago, she mm -hmm. retired before she even went pro because she said she was having trouble. Yeah. So like it happens to people even before they go pro, just so that, you know. That's crazy to think about before your career even starts. You can't, yeah, you have to quit just because your body can't take it. That would suck. I don't think the brain heals like that. You know, like you break your arm, it heals, but your brain, like we don't know about it very well, you know? Mm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's way over my head for sure. So yeah, there's a ton of information there. I'm sure to, to digest but yeah uh, so yeah I, didn't, I guess i didn't realize right your brain doesn't heal properly when you smash it in and that's why like like your chin or whatever i don't know if it's the same thing like you we can't predict how long it's going to take like for me when i got knocked out by a slam like two actually um i was able to take like a couple of weeks off from all tra all training. And then I started doing grappling again for like a month only, like no strikes. And it was fine. That was like a month or less. Right. But then one of my training partners got knocked out in a, in a, in the gym oh. by a not nice training partner. And he would like, couldn't train for months at all. And wow. then just got back into training at all, like multiple months later. So Jesus just don't know how long it's going to take. So it's, it's pretty serious then. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, we, uh, we all saw your article. Uh, um, it was a mixed article about multiple things, but in it, you talked about, uh, at says MMA about them wearing headgear and how you appreciate, um, them taking care of the fighters there. And, uh, uh yeah. I, I see why now uh, it's definitely important. It's definitely something they, they, they talk about a lot, fighter safety and, and having a longer career just by wearing headgear and protecting yourself. So, yeah, yeah. That's cool. That's, that's super smart. So, uh, our last one was, sorry. Out outside of like fighting, what is the weirdest thing a fan has asked you to sign? I haven't really gotten any weird ones. Um, I've signed backpacks and i signed the shirt on somebody's back once that was really cool he was like sign my shoulders yeah. like, oh, cool it's kind of like the... you made it <laughs> yeah i know exactly i mean yeah it's excited that was that was about it though that's uh no no sign my sign my body requests like i've never gotten to sign my boobs request <laughs> thank goodness <laughs> you see in the movies uh that's funny you never know 
A lot of gloves. Cool. I've gotten, right? um, I've got, excuse me, I've gotten mail, fan mail from fans. Can you sign my trading card? And I look at it and it's me. And I'm like, what? I have a trading card. Like, since when did I have a trading card? So I actually found out about all of the trading cards of me from fans asking me to sign them. And I'm like, why can't I be sent a trading card? And a couple of them actually sent me an extra one. They're like, oh, this one's for you, Rex. And you can keep this one. And I was like, thank you. It's so nice of you. I have my own trading card. So yay. <laughs> it's definitely something I would frame or put up somewhere. And uh, like, hey, every time someone comes over, be like, hey, that's me. <laughs> yeah, this is me. And this is me again. And this yep. is me a third time. Yeah, that was, that was, that was a was notable good. reply. That's for sure. Man, so so being a woman in MMA is hard. It's hard to make a career for a, a woman athlete. Uh, they don't get the same amount of respect as, as a man typically does. Um, what are some of the things that you've had to overcome being a woman in the sport uh, um, just so you could make your career happen? I would say two main things. Uh, one is, I don't know, it's like an infinity loop that is, is kind of like opposite each other. So since I was a woman, since I'm a woman, there are fewer women. So there are less opportunities to fight. Right. On the other hand, there are fewer women. So if there's a fight, I get called. Does that make sense? Yeah, so like, sure, sure. A lot of the time I'm like, oh, please, somebody give me a fight. Like, I want to fight. So I'm like, man, I'm just sitting here. I wish I had a fight. But on the other hand, I think because I was a woman, I am a woman, sorry. <laughs> um, I have, I had a lot more opportunities, you know, even though my, for example, my striking wasn't as good as some other people's, but my grappling was good. So I was winning my fights. So I got more opportunities to fight. Um, so that was, that's been a challenge. And um I think, I mean, my training partners have been pretty good. Just small person issues where, you know, big guys hit hard. But other than that, it's been pretty good. Everyone's treated me with respect. Um, I, I feel like I was, I'm very down to earth and I just go and I train and I wear like shorts over shorts and then t-shirts over rash guards. So I'm never like flaunting my female charms and like people don't hit on me and like, no, none of that. Like, I don't have to worry about any of that. So that was, that was nice. <laughs> I've never had any of those issues. That's good. That's good. So you've been in many organizations uh, while fighting. What's, what's your experience? Like the differences of the regional circuit and the professional circuit? Um, what are the differences like? All promoters tried really hard to put on a good show and be good to their fighters. I think depending on the money, it varied. So like smaller regional shows didn't have as much money. So there was there were smaller venues. And like one time for Fusion Fight League, they didn't give us a bucket or a towel. So I had to like run through the event and like look for some rag just to have a towel. But that's not their fault, you know, like, and then Invicta, they provided all that or UFC provided UFC, man, they had like our uniforms folded in this pile on a chair with a name tag on the chair and like snacks and all that jazz. So that was, but that's because they could do that because they had the money. Um, Japan also was like the smaller shows were kind of, man, I remember warming up in a cold hallway, like in a shed outside the venue, but that's because there's a small venue. What are they going to do? Like, so, you know, I understand, but it's just the, depending on the, the money basically is how much they were off, able to offer us. But I'm grateful for, I was grateful for any opportunity I had to fight. We made it work. Yeah. Yeah. You got to do what you can. Those are still, those are still really cool stories. And I, I bet you have a lot of great memories uh, just revolved around fighting, traveling and fighting and mm -hmm. the things you did because of it. It's just, it's, it's really cool. And it's amazing to me. So. Indeed. For sure. So now that you are retired from MMA, will you still do like uh, grappling tournaments like uh, Eddie Bravo's or Submission Underground or any type of grappling tournament? Yes, I would like to do that very much. I actually, uh, I think I might be fighting in the Fight Pass Invitational on July 3rd, I think. We're kind of talking about it. So I'm trying to prepare for that. So I'm excited. Nice. So what, what advice do you have for uh, women or anybody who wants to get into MMA and fighting? 
I would say do what you love, do it because you love it and find a good team that makes you happy and that's supportive. So with that, uh, how long do you think it would be good for someone that does want to get in fighting? How long do you think they should train first before they accept their first fight? I almost feel like people who decide they want to fight and then go to the gym don't last very long because they think it looks cool. And then they find out the training is really, really hard and then they kind of fall off. But then I feel like people who go in either to lose weight or for a hobby, or maybe they're a little interested and then they get hooked. They just love training, you know? So I think that you have to fall in love with training first before the fighting. And, um, man, I would, I mean, so when I coached kids, I wanted them to have three stripes on their white belt before they competed. That's because it took a while for them to build muscle memory of falling properly. So if they got thrown over their head, they tuck their chin and do a break fall. And I feel like if you don't have a lot of practice doing that, you might like put your arm out and break it or like hit your head or something. Um, and it usually took them like seven months to get three stripes on their white belt from me. I'm a hard strict sensei, but, um, I, I think like being at least a blue belt in jujitsu would be good. So you kind of know what you're doing, but, um, I don't know, I guess it depends on everyone. So at least a year or more. <laughs> so let's see, I did judo for three years, jujitsu for one year and kickboxing for like four years simultaneously. So let's see, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. I trained for five years before I fought. Wow. Yeah. but then i my in my debut fight i went and i armbarred the girl in like one minute so so it paid off yeah but you know i was just me going to college and then going to class at night so if you like commit more time you know maybe you can get better faster right. was it hard to balance your studies and your training when you first started no because i have super good time management skills <laughs> <laughs> probably the best out of anybody i know but you know, for a little, yeah, <laughs> it's it's good. It's a lot of people don't understand how much time can be lost by not having a set schedule. And I didn't do anything else. I didn't go drinking with my friends. I I woke up, you know, went for a jog, studied, went to class, came home, trained, you know, maybe went to the anime club for half an hour, and then <laughs> trained again. <laughs> All right. Hey, looks like it paid off though. You know, you, you've had a career that most people will never have. So you had to sacrifice a little for it, I'm sure. Yeah. But nothing wrong with that. So everybody wants to know you're the happy warrior. How do you stay happy all of the time? Well, hang on. Don't move. I'll be right back. Uh, I know it. You're going to get a puck, aren't you? Yes. A puck? Yeah, she has a book. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. She's got two of them and one on the way, right? You would know better than me, it looks like. I read her article. My mama taught me a lot about positivity. And so I wrote this book called How to Be Positive. Yeah. And in the, the 10 chapters that I made in the book are the principles that I try to live by. I don't know. Is it backwards on your screen? or No, nope. no okay. that's good. Our conscious thoughts affect our emotions. A sliver of moonlight, you can still see. So finding a positive, like the light at the silver lining. Being grateful, focus on the silver lining. Don't reinforce negativity, smile and carry on. Do the most you can in your situation, set goals. Be excited about everything. Try to understand other people, rules for behavior, readjust your expectations. So I, so I have various examples for all of them in here. And then like, I help people train their minds to think more positively. For example, uh, let's see, try to understand other people. 
So I'm driving down the street and somebody cuts me off. And I'm like, and a lot of people be like, oh, you jerk. Right. Yeah. And I think, oh my gosh, that was close. We almost died. I'm really glad that we didn't die. First of all, man, I hope he's okay. He probably wouldn't be driving, he or she probably wouldn't be driving like a maniac if there wasn't something wrong. Maybe somebody is, you know, maybe somebody's dying in a hospital and, and they have to get to them. So man, I really hope that that fellow is okay. Good luck. I hope you make it to your destination. So just by like, thinking of that possibility, I'm not mad anymore. I'm just kind of like wishing him well, him or her well. So kind of, if you just change your mindset, you know, you can make yeah. yourself more positively. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of fighters, uh, you know, talk about visualization, like law of attraction, um, always being positive, being grateful. Do you and your happiness align with those thoughts as well? Like with the law of attraction, like, you put out positive vibes, you get positive things. I think so. And I think it's less of a mystical force and more of you make little decisions throughout your day that lead you somewhere. So if I'm hundred percent focused on fighting, maybe I won't have that cookie or maybe I'll go to bed like half an hour earlier because I want to be training better for the next day. Or, you know, maybe I'll, not deal with a stressful situation right before training or I'll like make little decisions that will lead me to my goal, you know? So I think that's what a lot of people are doing. So when they're super focused on one thing um, or they think about it a lot, they're like trying to be like, I'm thinking about it, but actually they're actually making a little tiny decisions that they don't realize to lead them to that goal. So I, I believe in that. Love it. Hey, if you need a sports psychologist, hit up Roxanne, she got you. <laughs> <laughs> book sounds like there's a lot of good stuff in there that can help change your mindset change your mentality like like seriously it sounds like so if someone if books. someone wants to get one of your books how do they where do they go to find it my website which is my name roxannemodafferi.net i have a store there nice. just look for the links on this on the website awesome and we'll drop it in the description of the video on the podcast as well Absolutely. cool yes yes get your book <laughs> you be a happy warrior too yeah i think it definitely makes a difference like that the men mentality and the way you the way you look at the world and perceive things and and it, i think that was a good reminder you know like the car example when somebody cuts me off the first thing i want to do is be like you know, F this guy, but you got to think like, hey, they're going through things too. They got their own life and you got to remember that at times. So yeah, yeah. I like it. I think it's I think awesome. It's, yeah, yeah, for sure. So with you being happy all the time, have you ever been in a street fight growing up? <laughs> I'm not happy all the time, but um, no, I've never had any altercation outside of the gym. Just training. That's good though. It's yeah. Less distractions outside. Yeah probably because she's not out there picking fights with, with people who cut her off in traffic <laughs> <Yeah>. oh exactly <laughs> so a, a bit of a controversial subject right now it seems like uh, uh it's, it's getting brought up um there are a lot of fighters who seem to kind of fight dirty lately that they they eye poke, they groin kick, they grab the cage, they grab your gloves. They know they can kind of uh, push the limits a little bit before a point gets taken away. I mean, it's happening more and more every week, it seems like. Uh, what are your thoughts on people who kind of fight, fight dirty and use these tactics because they know they can get away with it a little bit? I remember somebody in the gym too said, you can do this because you get one morning first. And I was like, really? Um, this, I don't know. I'm a big rule follower. You know, um, I accidentally grabbed the cage with my toes, by, but, you know, doing it on purpose is your question. Um, we're doing a sport with a set of rules. If it was the street fight, 100%, I'm going to be eye poking people, but this is not a street fight. This is a set of rules. You have to make weight, you know, you have to follow the rules. Um, yeah, it's dirty. It's don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. Right. Boo! Ooh, yeah, yeah. So, speaking of make weight, um, you were on the Ultimate Fighter twice. How was it hard to make weight 
not knowing if you were going to fight one week or the next and always staying ready was it difficult not for me but for other people it was so for me on the first season season 18 i was i was going up a weight class um i had dropped to 125 and then i got on the season at 135 so it was pretty easy i didn't really cut weight and then the second time um I had done like a full fight camp and I, when they chose teams, I like ran right over to my new coaches and I said, I want to fight first. I'm so ready. I'm ah. they're like, all right, all right. So they let me fight first. So I was all ready. You know, my weight was on point. My cardio was on point. And then, so I knew that I wouldn't be fighting for another like three weeks. So then as, as the three weeks approached, I just made sure my weight was good, which I'm very good about keeping my weight good. Like my normal diet is it is uh, set to maintain my weight. And then if I have a bunch of junk food, it goes up, but you know, my normal diet's good. Um, so then when I won the second fight, you know, I knew I wouldn't be fighting for another number of weeks. So actually the last fight was hard to make weight. I remember like hitting mitts with my, my coach at the time. And I was like, oh, I'm so tired of this, but so I had the fight within like a week of myself, my other fight. But so that was that was a challenging one. I, I did know when I was going to fight, though, but just doing the weight cut so soon after the other one sucked. Was it hard living in the house with the people you were fighting and like having to get along with them, having to see them, having to talk to them uh, and then having to go fight them? Not for me, because I pretty much get along with most people. <laughs> um, I think for other people, it was more challenging, but I, I was pretty good. I liked everybody. So no issues. Did, did mm -hmm. you get in any prank wars while you were there? Um, somebody vandalized my toilet paper man uh, in season 18, and I was very sad. <laughs> and then they could see that I was like, sad, sad not like mad and then they got guilt they felt guilty <laughs> um but other than that no one i don't think people really did pranks in the season 26. it's yeah and they just started season 30 now someone mm -hmm. someone just got kicked off of the show because they couldn't make weight too uh, so i mean it's yeah a big issue and she was a, a lot over i don't know um uh, there was some yeah other she had surrounding mm, it, gonna... know, but yeah, so making weight is important for sure. It's unfortunate, you know, she thought that she could lose the weight, but no way. Like, I was, I'm glad that they changed people. I'm glad they got somebody else because she wouldn't have made it. Yeah, she probably would have never made it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. on the weight subject, um, like Charles Olivia had the scale controversy there's been other ones uh dustin poirier recently said they need to switch to digital scales do you think the gravity scale i feel like the gravity scale would be more accurate i thought they the, are more accurate i've i've read that they, they were too. yeah yeah maybe they can calibrate it more frequently mm -hmm. like you know you can bring a 50 pound dumbbell and stick it on there and see if it's you know the proper weight but when they get on the regular scale, like the scale with all the reporters, that's the third or fourth scale that you like as a fighter that, for the UFC that you would get on, correct? Oh, you're right. So when we show up to the ho the fight hotel, there's the digital scale that we check our weight on. So I always bring my own scale that I can take to my bathroom, but I go and set it next to the digital scale and I compare my little crappy scale to their more professional digital scale. But you're right, at the end of the day, we are being weighed on the you know, doctor's scale. What if the doctor's scale is not matched up with the, I just assume that it's gonna be matched up with the digital scale. Mm -hmm. So that was the issue with Oliveira, I believe. And that's like, crap. Um, uh, yeah, I don't, that's kind of- Do you the think US. he should have been stripped because of that? I mean, obviously it's part of the job description to make weight, but- um, Getting tough, sorry. Yeah. No, if he made weight, he shouldn't be stripped. But what I heard, well, I don't know if it's official. I heard that they, he weighed it, he weighed in. And then they were like, wait, it's not calibrated, but he had already started drinking. So then made him go cut again. Uh, but, um, yeah, so after we weigh in, 
they say, okay, you're goodbye. So then we just walk off and start drinking. I wonder if, if they had us sign something to confirm, yes, I made weight. So that way we have the contract, like, sorry, I just signed this yeah, paper that yeah. you guys endorsed that said I made weight. Like maybe they can add that in there, mm -hmm. you know, uh, maybe, I guess. Kind of I wouldn't mind that, you know, as a fighter. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, that makes sense. Because like, I remember for Invicta, there was the commission we did early weigh-ins. There was a commission. They watched us. They're like, okay, step on the scale. I stepped on the scale. You made weight. Okay, you're good to drink. And I'm like, are you sure? They're like, yeah. I'm like, are you sure? I'm like, yeah, okay, I'll drink now. Like, I was kind of uncertain whether I was able to start drinking or not, right? So there could be an added step in there. That would be great. Nice. Good thought. Good thought. Yeah. Yeah, we like uh, to try and touch on current topics and, and semi-controversial ones just to get other people's opinions and just just because they're so widely talked about, it seems like. Yeah. Another one I have is uh, open scoring has always been brought up. I believe Invicta tried it a few times when they had shows in Kansas City. I think uh, they're what, still doing it. Are they? What are your thoughts? Do you think, because I know Dana White has said he's afraid if they adopt the open scoring if you're up two rounds you're not going to try you're just going to coast what are your thoughts on having open scoring in the UFC I feel like that's not going to happen because um I mean I think that the fighters are not going to coast like fights have been all right I feel like fights have been changing. Like it used to be maybe like 10 years ago, if they took them down, they might lay and pray. Have you ever seen any lay in, laying and praying recently? Like you're aware of that term, right? Yeah. yeah. yeah I've never like in the past, like five years, I've never seen that. Everyone's scrambling. Everyone's jujitsu is good. Like people are escaping. People are scrambling. If one guy's up and he wants to coast, the other guy is going to be like, oh my God, I have to knock this guy out in order to get the win. They're going to be fighting hard. And then if the other guy runs away, he's going to get a stalling penalty. Right. So um, I don't think that's going to happen. It takes two to tango. You know, um, someone's going to be fighting their butt off and someone's going to be trying to win. I think they're all I don't think it's going to. Plus, if you look at Invicta, they're doing it and it's the test and everyone's still fighting super hard. Right. Like I've never, you know, now it just takes away the guesswork. Like, oh, gosh, should I win the round. I mean, mm -hmm. what do you there's mean? a lot of surprise like. <laughs> Like Rose Namajunas, you know, her corner was like, you've won that round, you won that round, and then she ended yeah. up losing. And so if you look up and you're like, okay, you know, judges said you lost that round, so now you, let's change our game plan. I think it would be more interesting, not interesting, but it'd be more adaptable. And the fighter, you could see how the fighter's fight IQ is and not just going in there trying to knock someone out. And I think even now if a fighter thinks they win – well, not even like if I think I'm up, I'm still going to fight just as hard as I did before. Like I would never coast. Mm -hmm. um, if you're winning you probably are feeling great and want to like hit him more. So I think that's not, you know, the case with what he said. Yay. Open scoring. Go, go, go. <laughs> I think open scoring or automated scoring would be, would be a good adaption. Get the human error out automated i don't know if if they would would go for that i mean they probably do have some uh, automated scoring at some point like where a computer uh calculates the number of punches and kicks thrown do, do you think there's any technology used like that um bella uh what is Bf, pfl they might be using really some technology i hadn't heard of that big on their their scoring system and their their uh their cage view what do they call it i forget what they have like oh yeah i don't know uh where they look through the cage and um so i think they're they they're using a lot of technology uh to, to try and uh bring it into the ring but so i think maybe others might get on board with that too eventually yeah so what are your thoughts on uh jake paul yeah. He's beating people up, right? I mean, unless everyone's taking a dive, I haven't really watched the fights because I don't want to pay for them. Oh, so. yeah, right? I mean, I, mean, but, I mean, if he's legitimately beating people up, cool. That's what the fight world is, you know? Anyone can win at any given time. What do you think his thoughts of fighter pay? Because he's a huge advocate to pay the fighters more and keeps... Yeah. You know. I think that all fighters should try to get more pay. 
but I also see it from the point of the company too. Like it's not, so we're independent fighters are independent contractors and it's not the responsibility of the company to make sure we have, you know, as much as the champion, like the more eyes you bring to the promotion, the more money you make them, the more you should be paid. So I understand if undercard fighters aren't making as much just because they're not as popular yet, you know? So I get it. And I got injury. Uh, I got insurance when I hurt my knee in training. That was pretty cool. So I had to pay a big deductible. Um, but you know, the UFC helped me with that. So that was cool. And I know other promotions um, probably might not, but mm -hmm. this is our choice too. It's not like someone's twisting our arm and saying, get in that freaking cage. Like it's my choice to be a fighter. You know, we love it. So that's why we do it. So right, that's the way right. it goes, but you know, I would love a union. I would love all that. Like that would be great. Sure. Do you think Jake, Jake Paul could help with that? Do you think, do you think what he's doing is even doing any good? Or do you think he's, he's really like advocating for them? Or do you think he's just trying to bring more attention to himself uh, just to kind of keep himself in the spotlight? Say, Hey, look at me. I'm Jake Paul. I'm fighting for you, you know, or. Um, I think both. I think that people are listening because he's Jake Paul and making noise. I think he's bringing attention to himself and he's bringing attention to this issue. So that's really great of him to do that. On all, on all accounts. Cool. Thanks, Jake Paul. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Jake Paul, I guess. <sighs> what the wrong with that? So what do you think about the Cain Velasquez situation? Are you familiar with it? Yeah. Man, he should have, like, dragged the guy out of the car and beat him up with his fist. <laughs> his ass or something, yeah. Right? Like, I'm totally so in support of old school like you hurt my family i'm gonna beat you up right. but sure you shot the wrong guy right that's unfortunate so i don't know i i hope that you know such a terrible thing that happened to his daughter and i hope that you know his lawyers help him get off lightly for sure yeah my heart goes out to him it's definitely yeah. a, a crappy situation yeah it sucks but it's it seems like it's like one of the most popular conversation topics in mma still it's been months and months and months but yeah and unfortunately what is happening with him now is going to take away from all the good that he did in the wrestling community and in the ufc so with that what do you what do you feel like you want your legacy to be um i want to be remembered as a martial artist you know, who just worked really hard and wasn't athletically gifted, you know, and just worked hard and had a good adventure. Awesome. awesome. With that, we have one more thing to ask. Uh, do you have any sponsors that you would like to give a shout out to or give thanks to? Yeah, uh, X Marshall. Uh, xmarshall.com is my gi sponsor my my, um, my excuse me rash guard and clothing sponsor they're awesome they have a lot of cool stuff that let you show your personality also my consumer it is um a internet service provider company they've helped me a lot and sponsored me and they're good they're pretty good they do a lot of like server and security things for people with online companies nice we like IT stuff, so that's yeah. cool. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, we're we're both uh, programmers, so. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. we're really lucky. Excellent. Was that all your sponsors? Did you have any more? Uh, those are the two that are sponsoring me right now. So. Sweet. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. Well, cool, cool. I'm sure we could keep you here all day and ask you a million questions, but we've all got a ton of other stuff to do. I've got to go train, and uh, you know, you. But we uh. We really appreciate you being on the show and taking time out of your day to, to get to know you a little bit better, to, to let the fans know more info about you. Uh, so we really appreciate you being here. Uh, so thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. yeah. Pat, any closing thoughts from you? I was going to say, uh, you know, thanks for taking your time. Uh, if you want to be a happy warrior like Roxanne, you know, go to RoxanneModifary.net get her book if you have kids that you want to get into jujitsu you're now training uh 
bigger kids, correct? Or little kids? I, I'm I read training the older kids, uh, seven to 12 at Tribe oh. Vegas. Awesome. So thank you very much and hope you have a wonderful day. Yeah, yeah. So hit that subscribe button as well. All right. This has been another episode of Two Dudes in a Cage, Fighter Spotlight, Roxanne Mataferi. Thank you all for joining. Thank you. Thank you.